Luke chapter 4, verses um, 14 through 22, we were reading this morning. And actually what we did, we got down in the Spirit, and the Spirit of the Lord's upon me because it anointed me. We stopped there and never got back. So let's start over, and we'll see if we can't get back. Hallelujah. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee and went, into the, and went out of fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. Well, it's good to be glorified of all. When they, you, know, and it's, you know, what amazes me is people love you one minute, they all glorify him. And before this is over, they're about ready to kill him. <clears throat> they glorified him all. Amen. And, uh, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, uh, he stood up for to read. Pray, well, thank God Jesus had a custom. You know, you know the customs aren't bad if they're biblical. Amen. And there was delivered on him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now, you understand that was probably a scroll, and not, you know, more than a book as a scroll. And, um, you know, he was able to, they unrolled the scroll. And, and it says here, and, um, and when he opened the book, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, remember, he's anointed. When we started talking about it, we started talking about this morning, how, what, what is the anointing for? And we kind of went off on a different vein. Um, and that's okay. You know, God leads us in different veins. In different services and different, you know, different times, and uh, <clears throat> so, wow, man, sound like Darth Vader just showed up. <laughs> Hallelujah! I mean, I better not cough again. Did you hear that, Dick? Oh, it was a deep rumble bass. Yeah, I mean, I coughed and it sounded like you know, uh, uh, an imperial cruiser came by or something. The Carillion class. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> oh my! <clears throat> Whatever it was, it's gone. <laughs> and we just we jumped at the light speed, and left it behind. Come on, guys, hook up with me here. <laughs> all right, all right. There was delivered unto the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He's anointed me." So, no, in other words, the Holy Ghost. You no. Know, the Holy Ghost comes on us for a reason. Amen. Now, listen, we understand this. And, and Dad Hagen had a series out a number of years ago called The Spirit Within, The Spirit Upon. And uh, we all know when you get, now listen, you know, when you get born again, you get, you get the witness of the Spirit. Amen. People who, people who don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, they say, well, I've got the Holy Ghost, and they do. They've got the witness of the Spirit. They're born of the Spirit. Their, their spirit bears witness, the Spirit bears witness with their spirit. They're the children of God. If you're born again, you have the witness of the Spirit. But there is an experience subsequent to that called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if you'll study the Bible, it's, it's very clear in the book of Acts that they had people who got filled with the Holy Ghost after they were born again. Amen. Who could forbid these men's waters that, you know, see they receive the Spirit as we. Hallelujah. When, you know, when he heard that Samaria had received Christ, they sent unto them Peter and John, who they would come down by lay hands on them, that they might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, as yet, for as yet he was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So it said they had received the word of God, been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were saved. They were born again. But they came down to lay hands on them to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. See, so, 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 you know, so you got filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's over in Acts chapter 5. Is that right, Bill? Or 8? Okay. But, but, but Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. People giving heed to him, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he wrought. Eight, chapter, eight, uh, Acts chapter 8. And so over in Acts chapter 8, it says they sent Peter and John down there to get him filled with the Holy Ghost after they had received the word of God and were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So getting filled with the Holy Ghost had to be something different than getting saved, didn't it? If they sent Peter and John down there to get him filled with it. Isn't that right? Okay, well, see, well, you got the baptism of the Spirit. Well, see, that's the Spirit that's within. So you have the Spirit within, and then the Spirit comes upon them. You know, you get anointed. Now, how many know that Jesus had the Spirit within? He's a son, he was God. He was, he was as much God as he could ever be. And the Spirit came on him. He said, the Spirit's upon me. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Remember, he was baptized in the river Jordan. The Holy Ghost descended in the body shape of the form of a dove came upon him and heard a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, and then he, so he comes out because the first thing he does is run to uh, the Nazareth, gets the scroll, opens it up and says, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me. For he hath anointed. Now, we talked about the word anointed this morning meaning to be to, be, to smear upon or to, <clears throat> to, to consecrate with oil and to separate for service. So Jesus was separated for service, but the anointing came on. What was anointed? The, what did the anointing do? In other words, in its separating, you know, the, the, we, we said this morning in a real quick explanation that it meant that when you were appointed to an officer to a service, that, there, that the, 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 the gifts and, and whatever that was necessary to help you serve in that office 
came with it. And so when Jesus was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him because he was anointed. So there, there was a smearing upon him, as it were, or a, a pouring out on him, uh, an anointing for a reason. Now let me say this. When, the Holy God, when you're anointed for something, it's not just that so you can get a goose bump. Or as they said in Balto, people bumps. If you ever saw the little cartoon movie Balto, the goose got people bumps. He didn't get goose bumps, he got people bumps. Hallelujah. <clears throat> see, you've got to see cartoons, guys. They keep you young. And so Jesus said that there was a reason he was anointed. Amen? Now, we talked about this morning over in Isaiah 10, 27, that the anointing was the yoke destroying, burden moving, band, uh, uh, band loosing power of God. And so Jesus says, I'm anointed. He's anointed me too. And then he goes on and says this, to, um, to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty to them that are bruised. So in other words, the, the anointing was to be used in the liberation of people who held captive and held in bondage. Amen? Whether in our personal lives we get liberated, or we, or, and, and primarily as a church we're supposed to be, we're supposed to get free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And when you get free, then you're supposed to go take the anointing and set people free. Break the bonds. Destroy the yokes. Loose the bands. And help, the, and, and help humanity be free. Can you say amen? So God wants you to be a person who helps people get set free. With what? The anointing. I said with the anointing. God wants you walking in a place that you're doing those things. <clears throat> so as Jesus said here, he said, you know, um, he has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. And some people would say that's poor in spirit. Doesn't mean poor financially necessary. Um, although God wants poor people set free from being impo impoverished. To heal the brokenhearted. Preach deliverance. And I'll tell you, that covers a whole list of stuff, a whole litany of things. Preaching deliverance to the captives. Because you can be held captive by all kinds of stuff. God wants people free from captivity. Can you say amen? God doesn't want people bound. Jesus came to help set them, set them free. Amen. Recovery of sight to the blind, the liberty of them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And again, that, we refer to this, but, you know, the preach the acceptable year of the Lord is Messiah's, is, is, um, is the year of Jubilee, the restoration of all that's been lost. God wants you restored. Oh, thank God for it. I said thank God for it. Amen. People, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I know people have lost ground in the past decade financially. There's been a lot of people who have lost ground. I'm, now, <clears throat> I remember when we, right after the housing bubble thing, what, 2007, 2008, know, wherever the housing bubble cracked, I mean, just went. We lost about 60%, 50 or 60% of our value of our retirement what we had set, set aside for retirement in just a couple months. Man, it's worked its way back up. We're about back where we were a few, uh, uh, five, six years ago. But I mean, you know, just boom. Just, you, know, you look down there, oh, my goodness. What do we do? Do we take it out? What do we do? Because <laughs> it was gone. You know, and I know some people lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some people lost millions of dollars. You know, past few years financially, a lot of people have been lost, been tough. But you know what God says? You know, he's been sent to the Jubilee. There's a Jubilee for you. I said, there's a Jubilee for you. There's a Jubilee for our church. Hallelujah. Restoration. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Got, there's, a, there's a restoration and a bringing back. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and recovery and, and restoration, restoration things. So, um, of course, then Jesus said, you know, he closed the book, gave it to the minister, sat down, the eyes of all them in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. They all bearing witness and wondered his gracious words were perceived out of his mouth. Now, one minute, they're gracious. A few minutes later, who was he? Amen. And uh, they all, you know, and he said, and, and they, uh, the first thing they said, here, here's the devil again. We talked about this a little bit this morning along these lines. Is this not Joseph's son? See, one minute they're talking about the gracious words coming out of his mouth, bearing witness with, you know, staring, and then all of a sudden they, they start asking, is this not Joseph's son? And you find out they got offended. Just a few minutes later, they're totally offended at him about what he said. You know, is this not Joseph's son? And, um, if you go on, Jesus, you know, says a few things here. <laughs> He's pretty straight up with them. And look at verse 28. And they all they in the synagogue heard these things were filled with wrath. Now, wait a minute. 
Verse 22, bear him witness and wonder at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. Verse 28, they were filled with wrath and rose up to thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill wherein the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. They were going to kill him. Did you know that in order for you to receive and act upon and, and get the anointed to work in your life, you've got you've to keep the right attitude towards the word? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus was quoting um, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, sent me to bind it the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening a prison to them that are bound, the, the proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness and the planting of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, um, hallelujah. I'm, trying, I'm kind of jumping around here. I'm trying not to jump around. Um, so, so he's quoting Isaiah 61. And, and when Jesus quoted that, he did not quote the part that said the, 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 the day of the vengeance of our God. Why? Because that's not yet. Okay, you remember the battle hymn of the Republic, the unofficial army um, hymn? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Well, how many are glad we're not going to experience the grapes of wrath? Amen. We've seen the, sweet, the, the lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory. How do they? Well, the battle hymn of the republic. <laughs> well, we don't, we're not going to experience the vengeance of our God. Aren't you glad? Who, who's glad we're not going to get the heat? Yeah, okay. Way back there in the back, we got Michelle going, I'm not going to get it. Hallelujah. Well, she's glad. Hallelujah. The acceptable year of the Lord is a reference, a reference to the year of Jubilee, a, feast, a feature of the Mosaic Law. Its provisions are described in Leviticus 25. Every seventh year was a year of release. When a Hebrew had become a bond servant, could go free. It was also a time to let the land rest. Then after seven sevens, 49 years, there would be a special event, the 50th year of Jubilee. Possessions which were, had been sold were returned to the original owners. Debts were canceled. It's a great time of festivity. It was the acceptable year to which Isaiah referred. Now, Jesus did not finish the, the sentence and the day of vengeance of our God. Um, in Isaiah's prophecy, two events are combined. The first coming of Jesus, when God's favor and acceptance would be made available through Jesus Christ, and a second coming, which would involve judgment. Okay? So, Jesus, he wasn't here at that time to bring the judgment. He was here to bring the jubilee. To cancel the debt against humanity. To restore what humanity had lost. To be released from the house of bondage in which man had been sold into. Amen. And Jesus said, I'm anointed to do that. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? So he came for that purpose. Glory to God. He was here for that purpose, and he was anointed to do it. Now we, the church, are anointed to carry that message forth and proclaim. Now we, we, don't, we are not anointed to, in that sense, be the one who cancels the debt. We're to proclaim that the debt has been canceled. And by laying on the hands of the sick, and, setting the, and, and, and casting out devils, and liberating people who are bound in their minds, we are enforcing or carrying forth the fact that that, that debt has been canceled, the price has been paid, and people can go free. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And so, um, we have here this anointing. Paul wrote in, in, in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. That means it's for everybody. Can everybody say amen? I just messed up your camera, didn't I, Bill? I challenge him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I'm going to move back here and unchallenge you. Is that an unchallenge? Yeah, praise the Lord. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. You see, the anointing is in the gospel of Christ. When people hear the message, there's an anointing to liberate them. Can you say amen? There's an anointing to set them free. There's an anointing to bring the life of God on the scene and break all the kingdom of darkness. The law, the, law, the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, has made us free from the law of sin and death. Can you say glory? Romans 8, 2. The, I was just quoting that. <clears throat> the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So there are laws in operation. And the laws of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus bring with it an anointing 
to liberate you from the law of sin and death. Can you say amen to that? Paul also wrote and over in Romans chapter 15, in verse 19. 15, we'll probably back up a verse or two here. Verse 17 says, I have therefore whereof I might glory, may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of anything of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through ministry, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto I can't, I, I can't even, <laughs> that place, I can't even get it now. Have fully preached the God, that place starts with an I. All right? Ilricium. Ilricium. Is that I-L? Yeah, Ilricium. What? Illyricum. Thank you. Illyricum. I would have never got that. Hallelujah. He says, so he says, from Jerusalem roundabout until Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Hallelujah. So Paul says here, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. Well, see, the Holy Ghost is the, look over, look over in 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 20, But you have an unction from the Holy One and know all things, verse 27, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye, not, ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it taught you, you shall abide in him. Now, the anointing is the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, do not read verse 27 and think, oh, I don't need to go to church because I don't need any man to teach me. That's not what he's talking about. No. Uh, if you read all this, he, like verse 26 says, these things that I've written unto you concerning them that seduce you. There are false teachers around. You didn't need men teaching you contrary to the things of God. That's what he's, he's not talking about. You don't need teachers. He, God set teachers in the church, so he can't mean that he don't need you for teachers to teach you. Can't, God wouldn't set teachers and then tell you you don't need to listen to them. Isn't that right? I mean, that would be foolish. I think it would be foolish. It would be like us you know, hiring police officers and telling you you don't have to listen to them. Hello? Uh, we're going to hire a bunch of police officers, and they, but you don't have to listen to them. You don't have to stop. You don't have to do what they say. They can pull the blue light, you pull the gun, you don't have to obey them, you can shoot them, it's okay. No, God set teachers in the church. So when he says here, you have no man that need that any man teach you, you have, you have no need for someone to teach you what the scriptures mean outside the revelation that comes out of the Spirit of God. You need, you need anointed teachers. You need men anointed by the Holy Ghost to share the Word of God with you. God said, look, look over in Ephesians. Just keep, kind of keep your place here. We may come back. But run over to Ephesians. Hallelujah. Somebody say Hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. Am I in the right place, Bill? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Hallelujah. I was looking for I was looking. I was looking on the wrong side of the page. You know how you get it, one Bible that's on one place and another Bible is on another? Yep. All right. Verse, verse 8 says, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it? Whether he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, then he descended the same also as the same, ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some teachers, uh, pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So when John says that you need no man teach you, he cannot be referring to men anointed to teach in the body of Christ. See, that's the key. They're anointed. They're a gift. They're an anointed gift. It's still the anointing that's teaching you through that gift. Amen? So, and so you'll get people around, well, I don't need to listen to anybody. The Bible says that I had no, no need for any man to teach me. They're in error. I said they're in error. Because, because God said right here, he set teachers in the church to perfect or mature the saints. Amen? They're there for, they're there for that purpose. So you do need to listen to them. 
You see, you get, you, you get people who don't, who don't rightly discern the word of truth. You get people who are young and think they know everything. And I'll tell you something. Um, in, in spiritual growth, we experience the same thing we experience in uh, um, human growth. The Bible parallels spiritual growth and human growth. Uh, when Christians get saved, they're babies. Then they, you know, and you know how babies are, everything's an experiment. They're they checking everything out. You know, you can put poison on the floor and they'll put it in their mouth. You can. Anything they find goes in their mouth. You don't want to leave your dog loose and let them have stuff in the house. You, you know, the, the baby will eat it. They just will. Then they, they get a little bit older and become childhood, and, and their curiosity changes, you know, and so forth. But everything's an exciting. I mean, everything's just exciting. I mean, every new, every new step, climbing the cabinets, everything's just an exciting trip through life. Somewhere in their growth, they get into teenage spiritual growth. You know what happens? Rebellion. Just like in human natural growth, rebellion comes. And all of a sudden, they don't need to listen to their spiritual leaders anymore. They don't need to listen to those who are over them in the Lord. They, they know everything. They've got it all figured out. Let me just tell you, you don't. Hello, you just don't. You know, and it's kind of like the little joke we have about growing up in the natural. You know, you get about 13 or 14 years old, you think you know everything, and about 30, it's, you wake up one day and go, man, my parents sure learned something over the past 17 years. They got so smart in the past seven. I, I, you, you can't believe 17 years ago, my parents were the dumbest people on the planet. And now, all of a sudden, I'm about 30. And I, they got so smart. Now, what happened was you finally grew up and realized that they knew what they were talking about all along. Hello. I said, hello. See, and, and, and so, but you see, things, same thing happens spiritually. You get people come along, they get to a certain stage, and they know everything. I mean, the pastor is stupid, everybody's stupid, you know, and, and, and they, they get caught up the same way that teenagers do. They get caught up with somebody who gives them something different and something opposite of what their parents say, and they do it in a way that makes it sound like they're so intelligent. They, you know, I remember one time when I was, um, when I was, uh, let me see how old I was. I was, uh, before I started dating Janie, so that means pre-18, okay, and, uh, and I had my Fiat Spider, which means I'm about, seven, about 17 and a half. And um, I remember going down to the beach with some friends, at, um, you know, and, and we went to some, a friend we had from another high school. Now, I'm out of high school now. We went to a friend that, we had, that was from another high school, and uh, his dad was down there, and he's I mean, he, everybody thinks he's really cool because, you know, he gives beer to all the kids because, you know, he just thinks it's, 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 it's the best thing to do is to, you know, everybody, oh, man, he's cool. I mean, he just, I mean, he, he's sitting in there drinking with a 16, 17, or 17, 18-year-old son, and he thinks it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. See? And all of a sudden what happens is, you know, spiritually people start looking for people who tell them what they want to hear instead of teaching them the truth. There's enough of them out there. They'll tickle your ears with doctrines of fancy and being fancy and slick and cool and telling you you can do whatever you want to do, all that kind of stuff. And, that, and people start, they get into that, that, that teenage stage of, of growth. <clears throat> and uh, let me tell you something. You're, you're setting yourself up because, you know, you're, those who the Lord set over you in, in, in life, God set them there to help you. And if you listen to them, you can grow and you can mature. And you can come to full fruition in God. Amen. Had someone tell us recently, you know, that they're so glad we've, we've, stu we've stayed with the truth all these years. They're so glad that we haven't compromised, haven't given up. And they, they said that, that people are going to come. People are going to say, you know, the big churches, the people are going to get tired of their big churches and not having truth and not having answers. They're going to come. Well, we thank, we thank God for, the, you know, the, their, 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 their testimony to us. We receive it. Amen. I said amen. Glory to God. The word helps people. And you see that, listen. When, when people come along and want to share stuff with you, that they, I'm going to tell you something now. If you're a traveling minister, you need to be careful what you say to the church. You don't need to undermine the authority and the role of the pastor in someone's life when they're teaching the truth. Yeah. And see, people tell, you know, it's easy for you to travel. They say blow in, blow up, and blow out. Just teach stuff in the church, and then you leave town, and you can left them with a mess. But you went with the offering. You got to be careful. You can't be greedy for, greedy for filthy lucre. And Joe, we just, I, so come on over here on Sunday mornings. Hallelujah. <laughs> now I'm just messing with you, man. Don't you go thinking I'm telling you something. I'm just messing with you. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But what happens is if you stay with the word and let the word correct you and bring it up, you, you'll get through that and realize that the people knew what they were talking about all along. Pastors knew what they were talking about all along. You ever had someone go, man, I got a revelation. And it's totally opposite of anything you ever heard from anybody else. 
There's a reason it's totally opposite of anything you've ever heard from anybody else. They don't know what they're talking about. Amen. I said amen. Hallelujah. Where was I? Oh, Ephesians. So, so when, Paul, when, when John writes and says that you have an unction from the Holy One and, you, and an anointing from the Holy One, and you have no need that anyone teach you or no man teach you. That's right. We don't need man teaching us. We need the anointing teaching us, whether it's through a man or through study and revelation of the Word of God. Amen. But his reference here, if you study the whole chapter, it's reference to Judaizers and, and people coming in with false doctrine. He's dealing with that in this whole passage. And saying, you don't need, you know, the, 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 we, we write these, we, these things we write unto you concerning them that would seduce you or deceive you. Amen. Well, thank God for the anointing. The anointing can protect us from deception. Because we know the truth. Amen. And he'll bear witness with us. So, now, so back, back over to 1 John, and then back, run back over to Romans 5, 15. Paul writes and says that through mighty signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit, so that Jerusalem, he, around about, he preached the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the anointed one, his anointing. See, he, he got to a place the man was impotent from his mother's womb, impotent his feet from his mother's womb. <coughs> and, there, and the Bible says, and there Paul preached the gospel. Amen? And, he heard, and the same heard Paul preach. And Paul, looking on him, perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said, Rise, up on, stand up on thy feet. Amen? Perceiving that he had faith. Well, how did he get healed? What message did he preach? See, he preached the message that the anointing would heal his body. Amen? That the anointing would heal his body. Amen? Had to. How could he have faith to be healed if he didn't have a message that produced faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. See, there's an anointing on the Word of God. If you don't preach healing, people won't get well. If you don't preach prosperity, people won't prosper. If you don't preach consecration, people won't get consecrated. Amen. If you preach that God will set you free, that God will heal you, that God will prosper you, people will start getting that. Why? Because faith will come to do all those things in their life. Faith in the Word. Faith in the anointing that's on the Word. To set the captives free. Thank God the captives can go free. Said, thank God the captives can go free. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? And so Paul said, by mighty signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit of God, we need the anointing in our life. We're saying this morning, anointing fall on me, or tonight, anointing fall on me, fall fresh on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall, fall on me. Anointing fall on me. Glory to God. Well, see, you get some people go, hey, you got all the Holy Ghost you're going to get. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, the anointing still comes on you. I said the anointing still comes on you. You got the Holy Ghost within. You see, I'm saying this, the Holy Ghost in helps you. The anointing coming on you helps others. We, we need to get back to understanding that there's more than just us. It's not all about you. We need to stop singing that song. You know? We sing that song, most people sing that song in church going, it's all about you. But what they're really saying is, it's all about me and my needs and what I want and what I got to have. Hallelujah. I tell you, the church is called to set the captives free. We're called to go to the highways and the byways, compel them to come in. You know, saw a friend of mine this weekend. He had it, their, their church was meeting and, and their vision, their, their desire, their dream for this weekend was to go out and get 500 people saved. And they got a big church. They still, they were believed to get 500 people saved. Hallelujah. Let's go get 10 people saved. Let's go get five. Let's go get somebody saved. Let's get the street sign saved. Let's get the stop sign saved. Well, how does it get saved? It says go when you get done. <laughs> it's been born again. It's been transformed into a different sign. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, okay. Anyway. Glory. The anointing in our life comes from God. The anointing in our life is the Holy Ghost. The anointing in our life empowers us to serve Him, to do the works of God, to carry it forth. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. I know that they had that whole movie out a number of years ago. Um, I forgot what it was called. But it, it followed Jesus. It was, it was put out by the Mormons. I just, it, was put out by the, it was put out in the theater. It was put out by the Mormons. And they, you know, at 12 years old, they, Jesus, would, you know, because the Bible has no record of what Jesus did between 12 and 30, specifically. 
So in the Book of Mormon, Jesus was out traveling all over the world. He was appearing in South America. He was building clay pigeons and breathing on them. They were living and flying off, all that kind of stuff. You know, and that just didn't line up with, is this not Joseph the carpenter's son? And where Jesus is referred to as the carpenter. Amen. So what was he doing in the 18 years? Building stuff. He was doing carpentry work. He was not in South America. He was not traveling around in caravans, working miracles at 13. As a matter of fact, when he turned the water into wine, the Bible says this is the first miracle which he did. When he came out of Canaan into Galilee. Amen? The Bible says it's the first miracle. As a matter of, why? Well, Jesus didn't do anything until he came out of the wilderness. His ministry began when he came out of the wilderness. Holy Ghost came on him. He was anointed. John Baptist says, you know, I, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but there's one that comes after me who's mightier than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. And so when he gets to John, John says, I need this. John, she said, he says, you know, uh, I, I shouldn't. Now I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. You know, when Jesus showed up to John, J John looked at him and said, man, I shouldn't be baptizing you. I need what you got. I want what you got. And Jesus said, it must be done to fulfill righteousness. And allow it to be so. So he did. He, he baptized. And then that's when the Holy Ghost came on him in the body shape as of a dove. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately he was led of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Forty day fast. After 40 days, the devil came and tempted him. The blood of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. He came out. And the Bible says he came out in the power of the spirit. See, only before Jesus was full of the spirit, then he came out in the power of the spirit. Well, Jesus was God. He could do anything. The Bible says he stripped himself of his rights to deity and the glory. He stripped himself of that. I mean, Philippians tells us he had stripped himself of those things. Set them aside. Why? Because Jesus could not function as God in the earth so that we could follow him. He had to function as a man under the covenant, anointed by the Holy Ghost. So he laid aside his rights to deity and the glory and walked as a man anointed by the Spirit of God. Now, that did not lessen his deity. He just didn't, he didn't access it. Kind of like undercover boss. Amen? Those guys go in and dress up, and they dress up just like the employees, and they don't access their bosshood while they're there. Yeah. <laughs> now, do they? I mean, you know, they could fire them on the spot, but they don't. Yeah. You know? Jesus didn't access his deity or godhood while he was walking on the earth. Why? Because he was setting an example of what man, anointed by the Holy Ghost, could do following God. To be an example to us so we could follow it. Amen. Now, if Jesus, in his earth walk, as a man under the covenant, needed the anointing of the Holy Ghost to fulfill the Father's will, we need it too. Have to have that. Three of you are looking at me like a cow at a new gate. I heard somebody go, moo. What was that? Three guesses. Three guesses. This is the initials are N-A-T. Yeah, put an E on it, you get Nate. Nate does a good cow, don't. Does a good cow imitation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul writing, church at Corinth, obviously. I thought he was writing the church at Galatia there. We go, this is where his problem is. You don't even know where he's writing to. It's a joke. Paul uh, writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brother, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. Now, folks, you need to watch out for people who come with excellence, excellency of speech or of wi natural wisdom. Paul said, I didn't come that way. Let me say something. Of anybody in the Gospels, anybody in the New Testament church that could have come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, it was Paul. He's one of the most educated men of his day. Studied at the feet of Gamaliel. And I may have mispronounced that, but I'm closing in the ballpark. Did I get it right? Or am I? Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Hallelujah. Um, he, was, he was a Pharisee. You know, he was a Jew of Jews. I mean, he was just like, he was, he was like a who's who of the, Jewish king, of the Jewish nation. Okay? I mean, he had all the awards. He had them all. But he said, I came not to you with the excellency of speech or the wisdom or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
And listen, he says, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, my speech and preaching. Listen, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. And that's what you don't need teaching you is enticing words of man's wisdom. Okay? But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul was saying, man, you don't need some, some cool, slick, eloquent, you know, uh, delivery of a, of, a, of a humanistic message. You need the power of God. Amen? Why did he say that? Let your faith not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <clears throat> That's why we need to walk in the anointing. We need the anointing in our lives as individuals. We need it in our lives as ministers. We need, to, we need to minister on the platform for the anointing. We need to minister from the pulpit in the anointing. We need to minister as, as, as uh, congregational members to the lost in the anointing and, the church, and, and people outside in the anointing. Because they can't stand in your, your fancy talk. We have people who try, try to train people in techniques to get people to be saved through, through slick talk. Man, just go preach the gospel to have to demonstrate the power of the Spirit and let that work on them. Amen. And kind of like I told you one time, we had somebody, you know, they went out to a, a children's juvenile detention center, came back after and told me, they were just all over them and said, oh, everybody got saved. Wow, I mean, I'm excited with them. Yeah, they all got saved. Well, tell me what happened. Well, we went there and ministered, and we called everybody down in the front, got them all down at the front, and while we were there, we, we stopped, we looked at them and says, every one of you that want to reject Jesus Christ, take a step backwards. And nobody took a step backwards. They, all, they were all saved. Well, did they confess him as Lord? No, they, they, didn't, they didn't reject him. Really? The Bible says if you confess that he's Lord and believe in your heart God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Didn't say anything about not taking a step backwards. See, that's trickery. You know? Are you here? Had one guy one time, when we first moved to Greensboro, he, he was in church. He, and this girl came with him that he worked with. And at the church, she's over on the side of, on the, side of the platform there crying. And she, he's over there. He's in his posture of ministry. You know, let me tell you something. People don't give a rip about your posture of ministry. They want to know if you've got the power of the Spirit. They can set them free. You know, he's, he's, he's sitting there. And that's why I slip over kind of nonchalantly and just kind of listen in for a minute and he's over there telling her she is saved and she's saying that she's over there going I don't want to be well I said sin unto death well, no 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 see what happened was at work that week he hounded her until she just followed him in the prayer just to get him off her case well, what's it she's not saved. how do you know there's no faith if you do something to get somebody off your case there's no faith so I just interrupted him. I said, I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, well, he, and he, he, starts, he starts stepping in and going, well, you know, she, I led her to the Lord this week, but she's questioning her salvation. I said, what, what was She said, I don't believe I'm saved, and I, I really don't want to be. Well, I said, well, you know what? That's okay. You're not. He, got, he didn't like that. He left the church not long after that. He got mad with me. Oh, yeah. He got furious. And then I got him outside later and said, you, you know, you can't do that. They have, to, they have to believe it in their heart and say it with their mouth. Well, she did. I know she did. How do you, here she is three days later saying she don't want it. No, she, you know, she did to get you off her case. I said, no, listen, God loves you. God wants to save you. And when you're ready to give your heart to him, he's there. But you can't trick them into it. Are you here? You can't convince them that because they did what you said to do. And they didn't mean it. You got, if you say it with your mouth and believe in your heart. See, trickery. We don't need to be tricking people into the kingdom. Hello? Everybody that wants to go to hell, get up and leave the building right now. Nobody left. Okay, you're saved. Now listen. Even Led Zeppelin didn't want to go to hell. Because they thought there was a stairway to heaven. Hello? See, they, they believed that there was a back stairway out of hell up into heaven. And after a certain amount of time, after partying for a while, God was going to open the door. They could all run up there and go to heaven. They really believed that. Satanists believed that. They believed that they're going to get to go to heaven. 
That, you know, so they're going to party it up on earth and go to hell and have a party. And then after, after they've partied out enough, God's going to let them all into heaven. That's, that's what the song Stairway to Heaven's about. They're finding a stairway to heaven. Now, anyway, so nobody wants to go to hell. Unless they're on drugs and they don't know any better. But not everybody's willing to commit to Jesus Christ and accept his lordship over their life. So we can't come with cute little sneaky stuff and get them in. And then try to convince them that they're in when they're not in. What do we do? We come not with excellency of speech or wisdom, but in, but in the power, but in, but in the power and in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. That their faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, the anointing will bring people to a different place. The reality of the power of God brings people to a different place. It is the Spirit of God that strives with man and deals with his heart and, and, and ministers life to him. Not your, not your cuteness. Amen. You know. Well, you don't have to give your heart. To, I mean, listen, you had somebody, some major religious figure recently say that you don't have to um, uh, get saved to go to heaven or something like that. You don't have to be born again to go to heaven. Major religious figure. That's a problem. I said, that's a big problem because the Bible says something different. Unless you, see the king, unless you be born again, you shall not see the kingdom. Let's see. Uh, um, Paul, Jesus, John 3. I, I, I started misquoting it now. I can't get it straight in my Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now, you come along there and say to me somehow or another, you don't have to be born again to go to heaven, and there, we got a problem. But people feel good. Well, I don't have to, I don't have to do that Christian thing. Yes, you do. You have to do the Bible thing. See, the church needs to be anointed with the Holy Ghost and power and have demonstrations of the Spirit and of power and share the truth with people so it will set them free. If they don't get the truth, they don't get the anointing, they're not going to get set free. If they don't get set free, they're not going to get in. If they don't get in, they're going to hell. And we don't want that for people, do we? See, we're, not, we're not standing on the edge of the cliff kicking them in just because we don't like them. We're supposed to be saving them. We're supposed to be going out and, and, and helping them and snatching their souls out of hell. Glory to God. So, the anointing of God is, is on our lives to, to help deliver captives from Satan's kingdom and bring, and bring them into the kingdom of light. We, we need to walk in the anointing as individuals, as a corporate body. Amen. Let the anointing work in us. Can you say amen to that? Amen.